Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Genome Webinars. I'm Ben Butkus, Editorial Director at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Crystal Digital PCR for Accurate Chimerism Monitoring After Stem Cell Transplantation, and is sponsored by Stilla Technologies. Our speakers today will be Vivian Sternkopf, Field Application Scientist for Stilla Technologies Europe, and Elise Gori, a scientist with the Blood Transfusion Service Zurich of the Swiss Red Cross. Attendees may type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar presentation. If you look to the bottom tray of your window, there are a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. With that, I'll turn it over to Vivian Sternkopf, Field Application Scientist for Stilla Technologies Europe. Please go ahead, Vivian. Thank you very much, Ben, and thank you very much, Genome Web, for organizing this webinar. As an overview, um, I would like to introduce you to the topics Elise and myself would like to present to you in today's talk. As a start, I want to shortly introduce you to the technology and the workflow of Crystal Digital PCR that is performed on the NICA system by Stiller Technologies, as well as our new consumable called the Opal chip. After that, I will hand over to our very special guest, Ulis Gouri, who will tell you more about the Zurich Blood Donation Center and its validated application of chimerism analysis after stem cell transplantation in patients. Elise will introduce the Zurich Blood Donation Center's background and speak about how successful hematopoietic stem cell transplantation can be monitored by chimerism analysis. She will present how the SMB markers are selected and how she uses Crystal Digital PCR to perform the chimerism analysis in her lab and the benefits that Crystal Digital PCR can provide for her application. In general, Digital PCR is using the basic components and chemistry as a classical qPCR would. So a classical master mix containing a polymerase enzyme, nucleotides and primers and probes that are specific for the desired targets to detect. However, we do not run a big batch reaction, but split up in multiple, depending on the method, some hundred up to many thousand of parallel reactions. This allows us to have only a limited small number of target molecules in each partition, reducing the competition of the molecules with each other and permitting us a count of positive reactions after amplification has taken place in each of the separate reactions. The analysis then takes over by counting positive and negative partitions, as we can see on the right side picture, with an example of a readout in the blue channel. We see two separate cluster, the upper one in blue representing the positive counts, the lower cluster in black represents the negative partitions. To convert positive partitions into true positive count, Boson law statistic is applied by the analysis software automatically to extrapolate the count within a 95% confidence interval. With the crystal digital PCR on the OPAL chip, we create up to 20,000 uh, droplet separation, separations out of the sample reaction PCR mix and have them self assembled in a droplet crystal array, array for further processing on identical conditions. The crystal digital PCR that is performed on the NICA system has a basic setup to detect in three different detection channels, a blue one, a green one, and a red spectrum one, with excitation and emission ranges given on these slides. That enables the user to run multiplex assays that can handle more than one target at a time on different rules for labeling. All three channels are detecting their signals independently, however, on the same partitions generated, so that the true comparison on the sample material can be made. This especially helps with handling even on small sample volumes and when a higher uh, or larger set of markers needs to be detected simultaneously. The new tool which Elise and her team has used to set up the validation of crystal digital PCR for chemorism monitoring is a single consumable that is called the Opal chip shown on this slide. A single chip can accommodate up to 16 tests on a reaction volume for each at seven microliter. The NICA system can handle up to three chips simultaneously. That gives us the flexibility to handle up to 48 tests in a single run. Each reaction is split up into approximately 20,000 droplets that enables us 
on a single reaction with a theoretical dynamic range of five locks. Handling of the ship is a simple process for it contains only a single pipetting step after removing the seal of the chip. The layout is designed to allow the use of standard single or multi-channel pipettes that are usually already available in each lab. Afterwards, the chip is sealed with a PCR cap and ready to, pre to be processed in the NICA system. The whole workflow for Crystal Digital PCR contains only minimal hands-on intervention. After setting up the reaction and loading of the chip, up to three chips can be placed in parallel in the geode system that will handle the droplet creation as well as the PCR amplification in one single protocol. That step will take on average about two hours with no further intervention required. For the chip readout, a quick transition of the chips into the PRISM system is all that is needed. In the PRISM system, all the three fluorescent channels detect automatically at a maximum time span of 20 minutes for a full set of 48 tests. The analysis software design, designed by Stilla can create and use templates to enable a quick and easy result exploration that can take even less than five minutes. Crystal digital PCR is already used in multiple application fields where a higher sensitivity is required along with multiple target analysis, sometimes on very low sample input, input amounts or challenging sample materials. It is suitable for rare allele detection, gene expression analysis, copy number variation detection, or absolute quantification of nucleate targets. The main field of usage for digital PCR in general is still in oncology, with crystal digital PCR also for functions as a more sensitive monitoring and detection tool. It also provides an excellent tool in hematology, as we would like to show you with today's application for chemorism analysis. And with that, I would like to hand back to Ben to introduce us to Elise Gurie from the Zurich Blood Donation Center. Thank you, Vivian. As a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. We'll now turn the webinar over to Elise Gurie of the Blood Transfusion Service Zurich. Please go ahead, Elise. Uh, thank you, Ben, for the kind introduction. As Yvian and Ben mentioned, I work at the Blood Transfusion Service of Zurich, which is directed by Dr. Beat Frey. As a member of the Swiss Red Cross, the Blood Transfusion Services of Zurich is a foundation which aims to provide high-quality blood products to the eastern part of Switzerland. We are also developing products and diagnostic services in the field of hematology and transfusion medicine. I work especially in the Department of Molecular Diagnostics under the supervision of Dr. Stefan Meyer. Our group is focusing on blood group genotyping for patients in a small scale, but also for our blood donors in a more higher scale. We also perform diagnostics of certain hematological disorders. And it is under this area of our work that we implemented camerism monitoring already four years ago. Back then, we used a chip-based digital PCR platform. Because of a growing number of samples to process, we were looking for a digital PCR platform with higher throughput and way less hands-on time. That's why we tested and successfully implemented the NICA system with the new Opal chip and all of that with the support of Stila Technologies. I would like to shortly explain why we use the word chimerism for patients after hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Like this very common animal here in Switzerland that you can see, a patient after any allogenic transplantation is in fact a chimera. So like our little friend here, is composed of cells originating from different organisms. In our case, the body of the patient is made of his own cells apart from his hematopoietic system, which should be produced by the transplanted donor stem cells in the best case scenario. In the rest of this presentation, the acronym HSCT will be used instead of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Here, it's a symbolic representation of the blood cells of our patients before the transplantation. After a more or less aggressive conditioning, the stem cells of the donor are transplanted into the patient. Chimerism monitoring is a diagnostic method commonly used to monitor the engraftment of the donor stem cells and hence the success of the transplantation. 
chimerism monitoring is nothing else than the monitoring of the proportion of cells in blood or in the bone marrow of the patient, which originate from the donor stem cells and from the receiver own stem cells. So when we do chimerism monitoring, we ask ourselves, how many cells are of donor and how many cells are of recipient origin? There are two possibilities of chimerism stages after transplantation. We talk about complete chimerism when all the hematopoiesis originates from the transplanted donor stem cells. Whereas we talk about mixed chimerism if some or all of the cells present in the blood or the bone marrow of the recipient are produced by its own cells. You can see here some the blue cells represent the cells which are uh, originating from the recipient stem cells. The optimum outcome after a transplantation would be a complete chimerism or a stable mixed chimerism over time. The clinicians have some treatment options if an unfavorable evolution of the chimerism stages is detected early enough. We do not analyze chimerism in recipient directly by looking at its cells in the bone marrow or the blood. In fact, we analyze the DNA which we extract from the blood or the bone marrow of the recipient. For this purpose, we need markers to be able to discriminate between the DNA of the donor and the DNA of the recipient. There are three different genetic variations which are commonly used in chimerism monitoring, copy number variation, indels, and single nucleotide variants. The short tandem analysis methods relies on the detection of short copy number variations. This method is still widely used, but it is slowly being replaced by more sensitive methods. Quantitative PCR targeting indels became a widely used method a bit later than short and repeat analysis, but it has some drawbacks, like the need of a reference DNA sample in each run for each patient and a calibration curve. Both short and repeat analysis and quantitative PCR targeting indels are the current methods for chimerism monitoring. But to overcome the drawbacks presented by short and repeat analysis or quantitative PCR, some laboratories have been developing methods using droplet digital PCR and even crystal digital PCR. A paper has just been published last month with a proof of principle of crystal digital PCR targeting indels for chimerism monitoring. We have developed our own methodology for chimerism monitoring four years ago. We target single nucleotide variants to discriminate between donor and recipient DNA. As I mentioned earlier, we first developed this method on a chip-based digital PCR platform and have just moved on to a faster and easier to handle alternative, which is the crystal digital PCR. Our methodology is based on the detection of single nucleotide variants. And as Ivian explained, digital PCR relies on the detection of fluorescence. Therefore, we selected single nucleotide variant genotyping Tachman assays. The assays we selected are commercially available from Thermo Fisher, and we use them to detect the donor and the recipient DNA in our samples, our samples being blood or bone marrow of a recipient. You can see in this schema that apart from a reverse and a forward PCR primers, Tachman assays contain a specific fluorescent probe, which fluorophore is being released if the probe specific target is present in the reaction mix. In our case, we have two probes, one per allele of the allelic SNV that we selected. If we take a simple example in which the patient or the recipient of the transplantation is homozygous T for a single nucleotide variant, whereas the donor for this transplantation is homozygous A for this specific single nucleotide variant. This would be our Tachman probes labeled by FAM and VIC. So for chimerism monitoring, we use only two of the three color channels of the NICA system. The blue channel for the FAM fluorophore and the green channel for the VIC fluorophore. There is also a red channel in the NICA system, but we are not using it for this application. We validated 24 single nucleotide variant genotyping Tachman assays. 
We selected them for their high heterozygosity frequency, and we made sure to have them distributed on different chromosomes on the human genome. We also selected them because they can all be analyzed with the same fluorescence uh, compensation matrix. The first step of chimerism monitoring is to genotype patient and donor for our 24 uh, single nucleotide variants. This happens with samples from before the transplantation. So a recipient and a donor sample from before the transplantation. We use a full crystal digital PCR run with opal chips per analysis for this step, step so three opal chips, one full run per patient. We divided our 24 single nucleotide variants into three groups, which we pipette from three PCR strips, as so on our opal chips using a multi-channel pipette. On the left side of our run, we pipette the DNA of the patient, of the recipient of the transplantation. And on the right side, we pipette the DNA of the donor. So this is our pre-transplantation setup. Vivian already gave you an overview of the workflow of the Crystal Digital PCR system. I will just quickly repeat. After we pipetted our reaction mix and DNAs onto the opal chips, we place them in the geode which is a device that uh, does the partitioning and the PCR amplification, which means that after pipetting the mix into the chips, we place the chips into the geode and then we walk away. Once the PCR amplification is done, we read our three opal chips in the prism. We obtain 24 two-dimensional plots to analyze for the recipient and 24 two-dimensional plots for the donor. So we have one two-dimensional plot per single nucleotide variant per DNA sample. So for a DNA sample being recipient and donor DNA. So in total, we have 48 two-dimensional plots to analyze. So two-dimensional plots or 2D plots look as follow. On the x-axis, we have the signal, the fluorescent signal in the blue of FAM channel. And on the y-axis, we have the fluorescent signal in the green of VIC channel. A theoretical result of a sample which would contain mostly VIC labeled alleles would have negative partitions in gray, VIC positive partitions in green, some partitions containing FAM labeled alleles in blue, and also maybe some partitions which contain both alleles, VIC and FAM labeled. And here they are marked in turkeys. If you take a look at some real genotyping data, so samples pre-transplantation when we select our markers, here would be a 2D plot obtained from a FAM allele homozygous sample. Here would be a 2D plot for a VIC allele homozygous sample. And here a 2D plot for an heterozygous sample. For all the 24 SNVs that we test, this is how we derive the genotype of the recipient and of the donor. If we go back to our example, we are looking at an homozygous, homozygous FAM recipient in blue and homozygous big donor in green. For chimerism monitoring, we choose two single nucleotide variants per patient. So two markers are preferably on two different chromosomes, and we favor single nucleotide variants for which donor and recipient are opposite homozygous. We can also choose single nucleotide variants for which the recipient is heterozygous and the donor homozygous. This is often the case for haplo-identical transplantation, for example, between siblings. We still have the possibility to choose markers with an heterozygous donor and a homozygous recipient, so that's number three here, but this constellation provides less sensitivity. When cytogen genetic data is provided to us by uh, the hospital, we make sure to not choose a marker which lies on a chromosome with aberrations at the time of the diagnostic of the disease. Now we can move on to proper chimerism monitoring. So we are at the time point after transplantation. After transplantation, usually after one to three months, we get the first sample for chimerism monitoring. At this time, we have already analyzed the donor and recipient DNAs 
before the transplantation, and we have selected our two single nucleotide variance markers. For post-transplantation analysis, so chimeras and monitoring, we don't need the three chips for one patient. Per patient sample, so DNA from the blood or the bone marrow, we analyze the two previously selected single nucleotide variants in duplicate. That's it. Which means that we need four wells per DNA sample, and we can analyze up to 12 samples per run. If we take a look at the first DNA sample of this run, you can see the two single nucleotide variants in duplicate here in Turkey's and red. Quite often, we receive a blood and a bone marrow sample from the same patient at the same time point, which makes the experimental setup a bit easier because these two samples from the same patient are analyzed with the same single nucleotide variance assay, hence the same color of um, SNV in this picture. Here, for a third sample, we would, which would come from a different patient, we analyze it with two other SNV markers and another sample with other single nucleotide um, variant markers for a different patient. And this is how we fill up the 48 reactions of the run, of a run post transplantation. Some single nucleotide variant assays, as you can see here, are used more than once, and some are used only once. So it is this single nucleotide variant and patient combination which makes the pipetting of the different reactions the trickier part. It's not the crystal digital PCR part of the methods that is tricky. It's just the pipetting of the reaction. If we now take a look at possible uh, results from a post transplantation analysis, if we stick to our previous example, in which the recipient would be homozygous for a FAM labeled allele in blue, and the donor homozygous for a VIC labeled allele here in green, there are two possible outcomes, complete chimerism and mixed chimerism. In case of complete chimerism, we can only detect signals coming from partition containing the donor allele, so only green partitions, and gray for the negative partitions. We can't see recipient DNA in this, um, in this run, so there are no blue partitions. But in the case of mixed chimerism, a significant amount of recipient allele can be detected. So that's why you see some blue and you see also some turkeys uh, partitions. As Vivian already explained, Poisson statistics allow us to translate the number of positive and negative partitions into concentration of targets. So thanks to Poisson statistic, we go from positive and negative partitions to numbers of copies of FAM and VIC labeled alleles per microliter. And using the template from uh, Stila technology for copy number variation analysis, we translate this data of copies per microliter into a percentage or proportion of donor allele, which represents the chimerism. These results are given with a 95% confidence interval, which we use to assess if an increase or a decrease in chimerism is significant or not. Now I would like to talk about uh, the validation of this method in our lab. So we validated our method on the NICA system using artificial, artificial DNA mixtures. We had two DNAs, A and B. We made a serial dilution of DNA A in DNA B, starting at 16% 16, 16 DNA A in DNA B, and down to 0.12% DNA A in DNA B. We did the same for DNA B in A. And DNA A is homozygous for the FAM labeled allele of two single nucleotide variants, one on chromosome 12 and the other one on chromosome 18. And B is homozygous for the VIC labeled allele of these two SNVs. Hence the colors blue for DNA A for FAM and uh, green for DNA B for VIC. If we take a look at the results for the single nucleotide variant on chromosome 18, you can see in blue the results of our measures for the deletion of DNA A in B 
And you see in green, the results of our measures for the dilution of DNA B in A. Throughout the range we tested, the results were highly linear. The results were a little bit above the expected percent of minor allele for DNA A in B and below for the green mix. We observed a similar linearity and distribution above and under the expected results for the other SNV that we tested. So this might probably be due to the pipetting of the serial dilution. This experiment showed us that the NICA system is very robust. And if we take a look at the results for smaller proportion of minor alleles, we can see that for at least down to 0.5% of minor allele, the results stay accurate. The true limit of detection lies below 0.5%, but 0.5% is a target that we desired for our clinical interpretation of our data. So to spare time and valuable consumables, the Opal chips, we did not try to determine, determine the true limit of detection. However, we performed uh, several measures of DNA A and DNA B alone to make sure that the limit of blank was well below 0.5%. And this was the case. So besides guaranteeing linearity and sensitivity of 0.5%, we wanted to know what would be the optimal amount of DNA input per reaction in the Opal chips. Our previous digital PCR methods, the chip-based PCR methods, required 40 to 50 nanogram per reaction. So here is a sample containing 16% DNA B in DNA A, so in green the DNA B. With an ICA system, we started experiments with as little as 5 nanogram per reaction. And as expected, the more input DNA we used, the more positive partitions we detected. So you see more and more green and blue points. For all these DNA input amounts, we measured a similar result in terms of chimerism. However, with 5 nanogram input DNA, we would get larger confidence interval. So as a compromise between economy of DNA per reaction and relatively small confidence intervals, we decided to select 20 nanogram per reaction as our standard. For future applications of chimerism monitoring after cell sorting, we wanted to test the limit of the NICA system with the Opal chips. Here, we tested the samples with 4% DNA B in DNA A with only 2.5 nanogram input DNA. We could detect accurately the percent of minor allele, and this was significantly different from measuring DNA A alone, so with no green partition. But we obtained, of course, big confidence interval. For 1% DNA B in DNA A, however, we could not differentiate it from a control of DNA A alone. So 1% B with that only a few uh, amount of DNA is the same as just measuring DNA A alone. It showed us that with as little as 2.5 nanogram DNA, our limit of detection would be higher than 1%. But this would not represent an issue for chimerism monitoring in sorted cell population because the cell sorting in itself is not as accurate and a limit of sensitivity below, for example, 4% would not be clinically relevant anyways. So in short, with the NICA system, with Opal chips, with our TACMAN assays targeting single nucleotide variants, we would be able to monitor chimerism even in samples such as sorted cell population from which we would not be able to extract a lot of DNA. Finally, um, to validate our method, we also uh, used previous external quality assessments. So here in this first lot, you can see how the results we obtained were really close to the target value. What you see is on the left side are the results expected by Instand, the external quality assessment provider. And if our results would fall into the 1S range, so the column in the middle here, if our results fall into this 1S range, we would uh, get the maximum points. And you can see our results on the right column. The first crystal digital PCR result, 0.03%, uh, 0 .03%, uh, was reported, would have been reported as zero. 
Here is another uh, lot of um, external quality assessment samples. We observed here also similar accurate results. So for these two external quality assessments, our results would have been awarded with a maximal number of points. So these were samples that we had in our freezer, uh, so previous external quality assessments. We already knew the target results, so it was done as pos um, a posteriori. But in May 2020, we performed our first blind external quali quality assessment with a crystal digital PCR with the Opal chips, and we obtained the maximum grades as well. You can also see that our results are very close to the expected value and are within the 1S range. So with this presentation, I hope that I could convince you that the Crystal Digital PCR system with Tachman assays targeting single nucleotide variants is a good alternative for chimerism monitoring, that it is sensitive and accurate. Uh, since we implemented this method, we could reduce drastically our hands-on time by at least three times. And this was our goal when we changed from chip-based digital PCR to crystal digital PCR. Throughout the validation and implementation, we benefited from a great support from Vivian and the rest of the uh, Stila team, among other Sébastien Avizou and Romain Pario. And now, between pre- and post-transplantation samples, the technicians of our laboratory are performing between four and five runs per week, including the subsequent analysis steps. So they do everything from A to Z. And that's why I would like to thank them and our head of department, Stefan Meyer, for their hard work and support, especially during the implementation of the Crystal Digital PCR system in the midst of the pandemic earlier this year. And with this, I end over back to Ben. Thank you, Elise. As a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. We'll now turn the webinar back over to Vivian Sternkopf of Stilla Technologies. Please go ahead, Vivian. Thank you, Ben. And thank you very much, Elise, for this exciting insight in your work and all the great results that come along with using Crystal Digital PCR and the NICA system. A great example on how Crystal Digital PCR can make the difference. Of course, if you're interested to learn more on how Crystal Digital PCR can help to make your life easier in your own lab, please visit us on our webpage, um, stillatechnologies.com. Beside our brand new application note for chimerism analysis, you can find here also other technical application notes as well as um, technical notes, for example, also for oncology topics, pathogen detection, copy number variation detection, and basic topics as how to evaluate your lower limit of blank or the results on a direct comparison of qPCR and crystal digital PCR. If you'd like to get more insight into Crystal Digital PS PCR principles and application, we also would like to invite you to our GenPy Learning Center at www.gen-pi.com, where you can find among simple setup tutorials also useful statistical tools, as mentioned for, uh, by Elise, for digital PCR um, use. And of course, if you'd like to get a quarterly update on our latest news, highlights, and developments, we are happy if you would sign out for our Stella newsletter available also on our webpage. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Vivian. As a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. We'd also like to ask attendees to take a moment after the webinar has ended to take our exit survey and give us your feedback. We'll now begin the Q&A portion of the webinar. The first question is for Elise. Other than indels or CNVs, could you simply use HLA variations, either by PCR or even flow cytometry, to monitor chimerism? Uh, hi, thank you for the question. Um, 
I think so. I think I saw in the literature that people have used flow cytometry, but the sensitivity was way below um, STR or qPCR uh, methods. And for PCR with HLA variations, it's out of my um, knowledge, but I am sure it's possible. As long as you use genetic variations, why not? Thank you. The next question also for Elise, have you compared your method to STR? Uh, we did, for the, when we validated the chip-based um, digital PCR method, we did with, with uh, some samples. Our results were similar to STR in the range above 5 to 10%, but below 5 to 10%, um, our digital PCR results were different from the short and M-repeats analysis, but I think it's just because short and M-repeats analysis is not as sensitive as digital PCR or quantitative PCR. I hope it answers the question. Yes, thank you. The next question is for Vivian. Does Stilla have any plans to increase the number of partitions above 20,000 or to increase the number of detection channels? Actually, that's a very good question, man. Indeed, we are developing right now a system that can read on six channels, even uh, to the three channel that we have as the basic setup. And uh, we also have a different consumable chip uh, called the Sapphire chip, which has a slightly higher number of um, droplets, up to 30,000. Um, however, here we have a throughput because it's a higher volume that we use on that chip to have four samples per chip. So it was a decision for um, higher volume um, or um, higher throughput. But both of them work similarly. Thank you. The next question is for Elise. The participant asks if you observed any differences in the results of bone marrow versus blood for clinical sample analysis. And the follow-up question to that is, is whether cell sorting is part of the workflow? Um, okay, so that's not really a digital PCR related uh, question, it's more of chimerism. We do observe usually a difference between blood and bone marrow when the chimerism is not complete. So in mixed chimerism, quite often uh, the bone marrow, the chimerism in bone marrow is lower than the chimerism in blood, but sometimes it's the opposite. Uh, if this person wants to contact me, I found um, an abstract and a poster about this where they compared uh, in same patient blood and bone marrow, and they observed a set, I forgot the percentage, but I did the same study with my own samples, and the difference between blood and bone marrow was very similar. So it's a common phenomenon. And then the, the second question was, ah, if cell sorting, right? Uh, we are not doing it right now in our lab, but I know that other laboratories are doing it. So it's a plan for the future. But at least we know that our a uh, crystal digital PCR system would be able to handle it. Thank you. The next question is for both of our presenters. Do you know if this method is being used to monitor cancer recurrence? So maybe I can start with answering it. Um, so, yeah. um, <laughs> Um, of course, it is uh, suitable to, to handle cancer um, reoccurring. And also here we right now um, are developing a special cancer panel that is um, designed to do exactly that monitoring of treatments and the potential of reoccurring um, of cancer. And if you visit our website, you also can see we had just recently this year also a nice webinar about this topic. If you're interested more, please visit our website to see the recording of that webinar. Thank you. The next question is regarding the number of SNVs selected. Um, the the participant would like to know how how they are selected. 
and is um, able to cover all kinds of patients. Yeah, so we, we selected 24 single nucleotide variants. What I did is I just looked for heterozygote, uh, for um, single nucleotide variants throughout the genome, which had a high heterozygosity frequency. Then I checked if there was there was some uh, assays for the single nucleotide variants in the Thermo Fisher catalog. And um, then we tested, I don't know, I think it was like a around 40 different assays from Thermo Fisher, and we selected the the one that looked the best and the easier to analyze on the um, on the Stila platform. And your question was if we can cover all our patients uh, for now with 24 uh, SNPs, and before we had only 20, uh, we, had, we had only 16 SNVs, and it worked. During uh, three years, with only 16 SNVs, we could find markers in every uh, transplantations. So, in, for every patient, donor couples, even in uh, siblings. But with 24 single nucleotide variants, we avoid a bit more the situation where the donor is heterozygous and the recipient is homozygous. So, what we want is to find like a good marker for us is when the recipient is um, homozygous or heterozygous, and the donor is homozygous. So, but with 24 samples, um, we have only a few cases. I think it's like two patients out of around 200 uh, where we cannot have two good uh, single nucleotide variants, but we can still analyze them. Thank you. The next question is also for Elise, what is yep. the minimum DNA amount you used for clinical sample analysis? So we validated for down to five nanogram per reaction, but until now we didn't have the case where we could not extract more DNA from blood or bone marrow. I think the minimum that we used was 15 nanogram and per reaction, and our standard is 20 nanogram DNA per reaction. Thank you. The next question is for Vivian. What is the fundamental difference between your technology and chip-based digital PCR? So yeah, um, that's also a good question because we talk about chips here, opal chips and sapphire chips. Um, actually, our chips are pre-filled with oil and then you apply your um, sample reaction mix and so we have a droplet-based uh, um, digital PCR um, within a chip environment. And the chip is designed the way that it enables that all the partitions that we create within are of the same size or volume, because that's essential if you run digital PCR. Thank you. The next question the participant states that STR is the gold standard for chimerism monitoring and wants to know if the costs of this method are similar to STR analysis. I do not know because we have never done STR analysis. But in Switzerland, um, there is a list of price for analysis and we can't charge our clients more than what's in the list and it's a price for same price for str analysis or digital pcr but i don't know how much a lab how much, how much it costs a lab thank you the next question is also for elise what method do you use for precise dna quantification um we, are not, we don't need to be that precise. <laughs> we used um, a nanodrop, but because we, th we saw during validation that even if we use five nanogram per reaction or 40 nanogram per reaction, we, are st we still have real reliable results. We can use nanodrop, and even if the nanodrop is two times wrong, we will still be in a good range to obtain accurate results. Thank you. The next question, can the digital PCR assay be used when there are multiple donors? Fortunately, we didn't have this situation yet. What we had is a um, patient who were transplanted twice with the same donor. But uh, of course, it could be used. It's just that we, 
it will be a bit more tricky for us when we choose um, the SNV mark, the single nucleotide uh, variant markers, and we would need, of course, the DNA of all of the donors. Thank you. Next question is also for Elise. Do you use enzymes for DNA digestion? Uh, we don't need to digest the DNA prior to digital PCR. We just extract the DNA and <clears throat> go straight to mixing it with a buffer and uh, our TACMAN assays. No, no DNA digestion needed. Thank you. The next question, would it be useful to leverage the third channel on the instrument and add a third marker or even more channels than that? Uh, in our case, because we used uh, B allelic single nucleotide variant, it wouldn't really make sense. But if you would use another marker, like the publication I, I mentioned from September, I know that they use indels and they have like uh, up to three probes in their mix. Um, so they use the three channels, but we use B allelic channels, so we just need FAM and VIC. For this application, the third channel is nice to be, but we're not using it. Thank you. The next question. What is the difference in sensitivity between the different standard methods for chimerism monitoring and your method? So the, um, I mentioned earlier, the short and repeats analysis um, has a sensitivity around one to five percent, depending on the on the methods. And quantitative PCR and digital PCR are way more sensitive. Apparently, some people reported to that they could go down to zero point zero one percent chimerism, but uh, to us, zero point five percent is enough because below that, you don't really know if it's clinically re uh, relevant or not. So quantitative di quantitative PCR digital PCR way below 5% and short and repeats analysis rather above 5% chimerism. Thank you. The next question, do you have specialized technicians focusing on this method or could you teach it to all of the staff? Uh, we could, uh, t uh, what, well, our, sp our technicians are not specialized, but actually we could teach this method to all of our staff quite quickly. And they do really uh, the setup of the, um, of the uh, program of, of the, um, of the chip, sorry. So they do the setup of the chip, they pipette um, all the rea uh, reagents together, and they also perform uh, the analysis because the software is also quite easy to understand and to get familiar with. Thank you. The next question. How many users can have access to the analysis software? And can I, for example, get a copy for my PC? Yes, another good question for the technology part. Um, indeed, um, our software is available on our web page to free of download. So it's a still our own developed um, software for analysis of crystal digital PCR experiments. And you can download it and even install it on your own computer, especially useful if you work in a bigger group or even share the system among different groups that are working with so you can analyze your own files on your own computer if it's a Windows based system. And we don't have any licenses, so it's free to download for as many users as you might need. Thank you. The next question. On the setup slide for chip, it was mentioned with the recommended master mix that a reference die also be used. What is the reference die targeting? Yes, also good question. So the reference die in our case with the Techman is fluid.
fluorescein. So we need to have the fluorescein, which is not targeting a specific target, but it's just marking our negative droplets. And we need to have the portion of our negative droplets to apply the Poisson statistics that it's not only um, needing the amount of positive droplets, but also the amount of negative droplets droplets and to give the negative droplets uh, a minimum signal we detect um, among in the blue channel which is not affecting the thumb detection beside um, so we don't have to block full channel for the reference star we just need it to mark the negative droplets or partitions thank you the next question is for stilla do you have other consumable types apart from the opal chip Yes, as mentioned before, we also have a second uh, type of chip, which is called a sapphire chip. And with the sapphire chip, you can run a droplet um, volume up to 30,000 uh, droplets on a 25 microliter reaction and can run up to four samples in one chip. Thank you. The next question is also for Stilla. Can I use other dyes than those listed during the presentation for the three detection channels? So we had put some example dyes on the three channels that we are detecting, but you can use any dye that is a specific fitting to the excitation and emission ranges that we had on that slide and that we are also happy to provide by our service team if you need assistance. Also, if you want to uh, use a dye that was, for example, not on the slides, we can help with our service team to see if we already have experiences with someone else using it and optimizing the use on the system. Thank you. The next question. Can I use any qPCR assay on the NICA system? Um, good question. So in general, we see most of the, if it's properly designed on, on qPCR and meet guidelines, uh, we see a high turnover from uh, qPCR been directly working on the digital PCR. Sometimes it's uh, required to have a minimum optimization step for the temperature and sometimes also for the elongation durations because qPCR often is designed to overcome limitations in that batch reaction that we don't have anymore in the um, digital or crystal digital PCR. But in general, it works pretty well for um, nearly every um, qPCR assay that we've already um, implemented with qPCR. Thank you. The next question, what sample types can be run on the system? So um, the system uses already isolated uh, DNR sorry, DNA or RNA um, or nucleotide material. So in that case, we can use any um, sample type that is properly isolated or isolated before um, from the material. Um, and with that, we have a uh, few limitations. We have customers in the um, food detection area that use samples out of fruit and, uh, we have um, in medicine and medical detection using a uh, different type of body fluids. We have even companies that use something like wastewater or sewage. So there is a big um, array of sample types that can in the end be analyzed with digital PCR. Thank you. The next question, is it possible to recover the PCR product after digital PCR? That's an excellent question. And uh, I have to say in case of the Opal chip right now, this is not possible. However, with the second chip that I mentioned, the Sapphire chip, we have the uh, possibility to recover uh, the post-PCR droplets out of the chip and to analyze it with different methods after. So there's a protocol you can use with the Sapphire chip to extract your post-PCR product out of the chip. Thank you. This looks to be all the questions we have for today. We'd like to thank Vivian Sternkopf of Stilla Technologies, 
and Elise Gorey of the Blood Transfusion Service, Zurich. If we didn't have time to get to your question, we will try to follow up with our experts. As a reminder, please look out for the survey after you log out to provide your feedback. If you missed any part of this webinar or would like to listen to it again, an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for this genome webinar.